I am, I'm super excited about uh, the webinar tonight, uh, primarily because uh, I get to do this with my good friend, Chris Heyer. Uh, Chris and I, I feel like I can't remember a time I didn't know you, Chris, uh, but, I, but I will tell you that uh, the things that, uh, that Chris and his colleagues um, have taught me over the years, um, I, I think were super important in going into the system. In addition, uh, Chris is one of the, um, of the design surgeons on the system. And so um, a lot of uh, the experience that both he and I have with the Lapidus procedure over the years um, are really showing in this, uh, in this um, product. So um, what I'd like to do is start off by recapping uh, kind of where we've been in the last four weeks. And um, you remember we started it and it was at the, uh, at the worst of the quarantine and this is a dad on day eight. You know, uh, we all kind of felt that, uh, but um, we've kind of come through this whole concept of Lapidus uh, with pros and cons. Uh, the pros are it stabilizes a medial column, it solves the deformity at the, at the center of uh, rotation and angulation. Um, it allows you to derotate the metatarsals, which has been shown uh, by multiple points of uh, research to be significant in the hallux valgus deformity. Gives you consistent correction if and when the joint fuses, and modern fixation allows early weight bearing. The cons are it's a bigger operation, no doubt. Uh, there's more swelling, more pain. Um, there is a risk of non-union, though in most of the new series, uh, the non-union rate that in systems that allow uh, compression and stabilization, uh, the non-union rate is, is really quite low, less than uh, 5%. The technique can be demanding, and that was one of our goals uh, with this system is to um, is to have that less demanding. And then hallux valgus can still recur, and we'll talk about that. So we like to say big deformities uh, need big operations. And uh, that is the reason why we set out uh, to design Lapifuse. Now, Chris, you've been doing Lapidus procedures uh, for years and kind of had developed um, a system. And, and I know that uh, when we first started discussing this and we set out with these design rationales, um, what, why, why were these three things important in particular in your practice? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rogers. Thanks again for having me. And um, yeah, I'll echo, I've, I've loved doing these, these uh, type of interactions with you and I always learn a lot from them and um, and it's been great working with you over the years. Um, yeah, I think, you know, Lapidus, I think your highlights there at the very beginning were really true to the mark um, in that we always kind of lean on this on, for the really bad cases or for the, the cases that came back uh, from another, you know, procedure and then we start to kind of find that hey this is a this is a go-to surgery that we can really rely on i think uh you know some of the things that i've always you know seen through my career you know we both train fellows over the years we train residents over the years so you really get to see kind of where people um where the learning curve is for this procedure and i think this was you know partly where we came up with this idea of some of the system enhancements here is that um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things to consider, particularly when you're thinking you're correcting deformity in three planes. Um, and a lot of surgeons just look at an AP x-ray and say, hey, I got it. You know, it looks like it's narrower now. But with the Lapidus, since you have that availability to reproduce three planes, you also have that complexity, you know, that you have to be able to balance that out and hopefully, you know, do it by yourself, not, to ha not have to rely on having a lot of assistance with you. Um, so I think those, you know, bullets one and three right there were were first and foremost in my mind because it was it was the struggles that I've always seen, even with myself and then in training other surgeons. And then I think shortening is a big problem, <clears throat> can be a big problem because sometimes people are already a little short on the first tray, but then if they, if they get even shorter, then you just, you feel like you're chasing your tail. And, and we all have that patient that, you know, we fix their bunion, but we shorten them so much and then they're back a year later with metatarsalgia or they're back a the year later with the second plantar plate tear and you feel like you're just chasing your tail and, and it's tough to keep a patient happy when you're always finding something else wrong with the foot. So I think, you know, trying to be able to get 
the stability you need, um, the correction you need, uh, without having to take you know large volumes of bone out. Um, you know, it's a it's a technique that you and I have used for a long time, doing an insight to joint debridement. And um, you know, people that haven't done that technique think at first that you can't get correction if you don't take a wedge out, and it's just not the case. You can you can easily get correction through the and maintain bone volume, and I think that's what we've brought to the system as well. Well, so um, what we what we tried to do with reproducible three plane correction is is kind of highlighted in this clamp. Um, you and I have always used distal referencing for our derotation and the, our three plane correction. So this was not a big jump for you and I. Uh, why why is distal ref referencing make more sense for us? Well, you know, I think this this works in a lot of ways. One is we're we're, we're adding the the compression or the reduction of the IM angle. You know, you're you're you have much more of a fulcrum because we're further distal, so you can really swing around the IM um, quite easily when you're when you're distal with this compression. Um, if you had this way proximally, you know, you'd, you'd actually just translate the base and you wouldn't necessarily get a, a, an arc type of correction. Uh, but I think this really allows you to rotate that metatarsal in the frontal plane. You know, before we had this system, you know, we were trying to do it with my hand, twisting the toe, looking at the toenail, sometimes sticking a K-wire in the bone and using that as a joystick. And yeah, you can kind of get it done, but as you can already see, I'm, I've got two hands, one on, a, one on a joystick, one on the toe. And, how am I going to do anything else? So this is, you know, this is an instrument, instrumented technique that really allows you to be hands free. You can, you can adjust, 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 reduce, and then, you know, the rest of the case is just putting hardware in. So uh, this has been a real, a savior, I think, um, particularly when the surgeons by themselves. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, definitely once, once you're done and then it, it makes everything speed up for sure. So we talked a little about shortening. Here's a 60-year-old with bunion surgery 12 months before she came to see me and has this severe metatarsalgia. So we know that shortening does matter. Um, and I've always been concerned with flat cuts because of the shortening. Um, and so the question has always been, with no flat cuts, can you get three planes of correction? And I think as we go through this uh, technique, um, we will certainly show you how that happens. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about this joint prep kit, which I think has really been a great addition to our armamentarium to have a short um, cartilage removal tool with a curette and then a drill to, uh, to prepare the joints and increase your fusion rate. Yeah, this is, that's a nice addition. We have all, we've all used our, uh, you know, the standard osteotomes that come in your foot and ankle or your ortho small bone tray or whatever. And it's also been used to pry out staples and chisel out, uh, you know, other implants. And so, you know, at least in our hospital, you're kind of a 50-50 if you're lucky, whether you get a sharp instrument or not. Uh, so having one of these sterile package deals is, is a really nice ad as well. Yeah, and here's an example with flat cuts and you can clearly see how much shortening there is. And, and this, is, this is certainly concerning that we try to avoid. Um, the other piece is efficient fast fixation. And, um, and we really wanted to have a one to two option. So once the clamp is on, the correction's done, everything looks good on x-ray, you only need to fix it. Um, tell me what you feel about compression and fusion. Is there a direct correlation between compression across a joint and then subsequent fusion? I think so for sure. I mean, it, that's a kind of a standard AO tenant that we, we're all taught when we're talking about, you know, uh, fusion fixation, particularly. Um, I mean, I think we've all went through that uh, phase a little bit. Um, I mean, I can remember when the anatomic MTP fusion plates first came out in kind of the late nineties and everybody abandoned cross screws. Okay. That was compression. We'll just do the static plate. And, and you'd see non-unions a uh, higher rate than you would when you had compression. So I think all of us now, for the most part, you use a single compression screw and you use a dorsal plate for an MTP fusion. That's, that's I think, pretty clearly the gold standard. Uh, and I think particularly these transverse type joints, 
that have a, a large surface area, very, a lot of shear force. Uh, you need, I, I personally think you need some compression across that joint to, at the time of the surgery, get those surfaces uh, opposed tightly. And then the plate, you know, is, is a, a neutralization, you know, basically a plate that can lock the rotational part and protects the compression screw. So I, I definitely think you need compression. Um, you know, how much compression, that's always a debate, but I think all fusions seem to do with the higher fusion rate when you have some compression to it. Yeah, I, I mean, my fusion rate is, has gone up dramatically when I've gone with this construct, and you showed it in a, in a great series that mm -hmm. you that you're, 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 came out of your center um, five or six years ago. Yeah, um, and, and I what think, about, you know, just to add to that real quick, I think at one point there was a concern, you know, back in the trauma literature when block plates first came out, that, you know, lock plates were too, too stable, too rigid. You know, and that was a really apples to oranges comparison. Those were steel plates fully locked and bicortical. And I, I don't think that that's how these lock plates in today's world are used. I mean, we're using titanium that has different modulus. We're using very rarely am I doing bicortical lock screws. They're, they're single lock, you know, single cortex lock, but that I've got the compression screw underneath. So I think you, you know, you don't want to make such a rigid construct. I think we all understand that too, but, um, you know, I think having the compression part of that, it's, you know, you're going to get some resorption. You want to have some compression there to help with that. Well, talk a little bit about the one to two screw, because I know you're a big proponent of it. I'm, I'm kind of maybe 20% of the time. Yeah. Um, when did you start using it? And, uh, and tell me how, how that kind of evolved. Yeah. So what we, what we mean by one to two screw is almost like a syndesmotic screw. If you think of that at the ankle, uh, it's, it's, very far proximal on the first metatarsal. So it's a first metatarsal to second metatarsal screw is what we mean by one to two screw. Uh, and I started using it, you know, uh, you know, humbly, I started using it because I had one bounce back on me. I had a Lapidus that was a younger girl in her mid twenties, very hypermobile. I did a Lapidus with a plate in the oblique screw, kind of my standard technique, looked great for six months. You know, I discharge her, say, hey, call me if there's any problems. She comes back in a year and she's got a recurrence. And I'm scratching my head. I was like, how did this thing come back? CT scan, solid 100% fusion across the first TMT. I'm like, where's this hypermobility coming from? And you could see six-month x-ray to a year x-ray. You can see this gap right at Liz Frank joint, basically, right between first and second TMTs. So that's where I really started, you know, self-criticizing and self-auditing myself, looking back at cases, started looking at even, even lapiduses that were still you know, clinically really good, patients liked it. You know, I started looking at x-rays and certain ones at around that six mark, since month, six month mark or later, certain ones you'd see a little bit of a, spl of a spring back. Um, and it wasn't always a problem, but if you're really critical, you'd see it. So what I started doing, I went, when I went and revised that one back, I didn't do anything to the first TMT. I just took down the, the, the space between the first and second met and I threw a, a screw across there and it, and it worked. So what I started then doing is kind of self, self evaluating in the OR doing my normal construct. Um, and before we had this device, I'd use a tenaculum to help me do the reduction, but I get my lag screw, my plate on, and then I would look at it on the x-ray and then I would pop the tenaculum and about to your number Hodges about 20 30 percent you'd see they kind of spring a little bit and you'd lose some of the correction um and then I would kind of make the decision on the fly okay is that good enough that I did, did I lose enough that it worries me or is it okay and then I start putting this one to two screw in there I put the tack on back on and put the one to two screw in. so again think of it the one to two screw is really a syndesmotic screw I prefer to use a fully threaded screw because I'm not really trying to compress more against there I'm just trying to hold the fixation or hold the, the reduction I already have. Uh, and if you keep it proximal, if you keep it in that proximal one third, um, I, I, ha I haven't had any of them break. They don't back out. I think if you get further out to metatarsal, you could run into stress fractures. So you definitely want to stay in the kind of proximal third. So I honestly, I've probably switched to almost 80% of them. Now I put the one to two screw in just because I I've seen that they just hold, they don't, you don't see any spring back at six months. We're going to show some cases later, and uh, and we may take you take you through that thought process again. So, 
the technique, um, these are, these, this is my case. And, uh, so comment as you go, but, uh, I make a formal, um, lateral release in my web space. I make a, a medial incision over the bunion and then I make a dorsal medial incision. So here's the web space incision. I have completely gone full circle. I used to make, I used to, to cut the adductor. I would even do a little capsulorapy. Now, all I, all I do is release the metatarsal sesamoid joint. That's all I do. Mm -hmm. um, because I was finding that my incidence of varus was, was too high. Since I've been doing this, I haven't had a varus. And uh, what, is, what is your distal soft, soft tissue release? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, if, I would say probably 90, 95% of the time if I'm doing a lapidus, I'm doing a distal soft tissue release with a separate incision like this. Occasionally, if I don't really see the lateral sesamoid, you know, what I call sunsetting, so you don't see it on its side on the AP x-ray, so it's not really all that displaced, but I'm doing a lapidus maybe just because they have more hypermobility, not necessarily deformity. I might just do the release through the joint from the medial incision, but the sesamoid can't be up on its side like that. If it's kind of rotated and you can see the side of the lateral sesamoid, I can't get it through the joint. I have to, I have to do this technique like you're doing here. And I'm the same way. I'll just do the suspensory ligament. Occasionally, I'll, I'll do a varus kind of stress, and if they're still super tight, I might perforate the lateral capsule. Uh, two to kind of let it go, but I really try not to release the adductor or um, or the FHB. I know some people take the FHB down too. I try to leave that intact. I just try to take that sesamoid. Yeah, I feel the same way, and um, and I and I really it's worked. So um, I make a medial incision. Uh, the capsulography is dealer's choice. Um, I used to take the bunion out here, like I do with a with a Austin distal chevron. Um, but now I leave, I leave the bunion until the end. I find that I'm doing a lot less uh, bunion resection. In fact, I always challenge my fellows. I'll say, this is where I would take the bunion now and draw it and then come back and say, look how, how different it is. And sometimes you don't even have to take the bunion. Do you have that same approach? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really good point. I think it's, it, I was the same way. And I think you'll really, if you take it here, you'll tend to be more aggressive than you need to be. And you can overstake the med head. I mean, you'll have this, you'll have your correction. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've got a, a sesamoid that's trying to peek out from the med head because we took too big of a, of a, of a cut on it. So I'll, I'll usually take just a little sliver right here. For me, it's just so I can see a flat surface. Um, so if I do rotate or anything, I've got that kind of flat surface there. Um, I just, I also do it cause sometimes I forget to take it at the end of the case. And I do want that raw bone there for when I do my capsulorophy. So I, I kind of, I kind of do it now, which is a kind of a redundant step cause I might come back and take more later, but I do take just a, like a blade thickness, but it's, you're barely taking anything. Well, we talked about Hallux varus, which is a, a known complication of bunion surgery. Rarely do we see it in distal procedures, but in proximal procedures, we see it. And so my case is a 67 year old, very prominent, active female, bilateral painful bunion. She also had a crossover second hammer toe. Honestly, uh, the second hammer toe was a big deal. And so I did a, a second while with a hammer toe. And you can see I, that's that, that bunionectomy. I also, this was before I changed the way I did my distal soft tissue release. You can see that this is, uh, this is a an old Darko plate, so this is a, a while back, but um, but compressed it, and I didn't feel like I I have a negative angle. I thought my rotation was great. Ten days post op, I'm not loving it. Um, here's that little peak peekaboo um, sesamoid that you described, and uh, and I'm thinking, all right, well, this is at six weeks. I'm going to be okay. And then um, at 10 weeks, not so good. And at 14 weeks, really not good. And, uh, and these are hard to come back from. And, um, and so this, this case in particular really changed the way that I approach this because this is not, pa patients don't want this because now all of a sudden they're getting, they have a fused TMT joint, now they're getting a fused MP joint. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I, I've evolved with my bunionectomy. 
And I just think I did too, too much of a distal soft tissue release, too much of a bunionectomy. And, um, and I, I really don't think I overcooked my correction. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, it looks negative there, but it's only because now you're getting this retrograde from the toe being embarrassed. If you look at it one more, one more, uh, visit backwards, the, the IM was, was parallel. So it, it yeah. looks, yeah, see there as a toe, it's just like you see in, um, you know, uh, rheumatoid bunions, you know, as soon as you reduce the IM angle, it lines back or the toe, the lines back up. So you're getting the opposite here. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just, and when the other thing to learn from this that we all learn is, is, you know, we always kind of talk ourselves out of it. You see it at four weeks or six weeks, you're like, oh, no, I'll, I'll just stick them in the shoe early. It'll, it'll come back, you know, and you know, you know, once it starts going that direction, you either have to jump in early and, and, or, you know, prepare for this. Yeah. Yeah. They, they don't like that. Dorsal medial incision at the TMT joint. I've changed that incision. I used to go straight dorsal. Um, I used to be on, really on the lateral side of the HL. Now I'm medial to the HL. Um, is that kind of where you are also? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm dorsal medial. I'm, I'm medial to HL and I'm, I'm, I'm probably right about there. Maybe just a hair, a little bit more medial. Cause I, I try to put it where, um, I can still get down to the medial kind of 50 yard line on the first metatarsal. Cause I, I throw that oblique screw uh, to the second caneiform. So I want, to be able to, I want to ideally be able to get that through the same incision and not have to have a little perk incision. Um, but it's pretty close to that same spot. Yeah, I perked that one. So we have this pen-based distractor and and Chris, will, Chris knows the design team, we perseverated over this distractor. Do we? And what we decided is just don't overthink it. Do, give something that exposes the joint. And this has been a 10. It really is great the, the 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 bigger pens don't bend with this distractor and you can really expose the joint and so that's when the cartilage removal tools come in um, this this just peels the cartilage off and you can see in in the pickups cartilage comes off in big um, big waves and uh, and I'm a able to use the curette to get down to the bottom of the um, of the, the joint. Any other pointers on joint yeah, prep? I think that's a great point. So uh, when I do the joint resection, I stick a home and then medial side and kind of pull it, pull it to the medial side. So I try to direct, when I do the osteotomes, I try to direct the osteotome kind of medial to lateral, you know, dorsal medial to plantar lateral, I guess, when you're scraping these things out. Because you're right, you can take them out in just these huge slivers like you're just peeling butter. And, you know, if you have that really sharp tool, you might do it in three or four passes and all the cartilage is gone. But you have to be careful. I mean, particularly if you have a dull one or I've even seen when people flat cut it and they're using a saw and they're going from top down, I've seen a few bagged FHLs on the bottom of the joint. Uh, and it's not, I mean, it's really right underneath the capsule. Um, and I think we kind of forget that if you're kind of plunging down in there. So, um, you know, I, I like what you said, get, use the curette from the bottom rim of the joint, use the osteotome for, you know, the, dorsal you know seven eighths of it or something but try to angle instead of going straight top down try to angle a little bit laterally so if you if you plunge you just run into the second mat you're not you know plunging into dangerous uh, uh structures there that is a that is a really great comment really great so um and then we drill now the the joint prep kit has a two five drill in it <clears throat> with a tissue protector which has been fabulous and the key is to create a slurry. You want to, you want to make, you want to have this bone really this good cancellous bone in the joint. Um, it, do you just use a drill, or are you do you? So what I'll do is um, the other thing I would say is before you even start drilling, flush the joint out so you get all the, you know, cartilage debris. And if you have some little, tr you know, shrapnel in there, you get it out of there. But yeah, I, I start with the drill first. Uh, I think the drill guide is really, really key because you know, you're gonna tend to flex the drill bit a little bit and we've all broken drill bits trying to do this freehand. So use the drill sleeve so you have a little leverage and you can control against that flexion. Uh, so I drill pretty aggressively, just like you say, you wanna see a slurry. There shouldn't be any, be any subchondral bone left. Um, and then if, um, I usually will take the quarter inch uh, osteotome or the, 
um, and just kind of connect the dots a little bit. So if there's some drill holes in there that still has a little bit of substance to them, I just tap it with the acetone a little bit. I also take the drill and, and drill into the adjacent second mat. Uh, so that deep, like on your picture on the right, that deep yeah. hole where the shadow is, you know, I scrape a little periostom off of that, but I also drill, drill into that a little bit as well. All right. Um, there was one question uh, that's probably as good as time to, any, to ask it. Um, question was, with lapoplasty, no first metatarsal head, medial exostectomy, or first metatarsal capsulotomy is typically needed, which helps immensely with post-op first MP stiffness. I believe it's a game changer. Have you tried lapofuse without this step? So what I would tell you is I have, actually, because... I've tried some of the MIS stuff to take down the joint, but you have to be careful because um, you're correcting the hallux valgus, and and that capsule is going to get is going to get loose, and uh, and then if if you're not going to even expose it, you really have to. I think most of those people need an Aiken, and, and we can talk about that. Chris, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot that uh, of surgeons that that um, go with that too. They try not to open the first MTP joint at all. Um, and I think there's some validity to that. Obviously, if you're taking big resections and things like that, it could stiffen it. I, I've had a hard time trying to explain that to the patient. You know, patients coming in with their toe like this and this huge bump here. And I'm known I'm not going to operate there. I'm going to operate back here and not touch anything about the bump. They don't get that. Um, and you know, the, the surgeons that I know that I respect that say they don't have to take down the capsule and eventually just kind of tightens back up. Um, you know, I'm sure it might, it might do, but it, it might take, you know, six months or something, or I just don't want to um, wait for that. So I think, you know, that medial incision, I think you brought up MIS, which is a great topic for this. I think you could do an MIS, you know, exostectomy there to your point. Once you make the correction, there's very little exostectomy you have to deal with. Um, I think the stiffness in the joint, honestly, is uh, from our belief in the past of really cranking down on the capsulotomy. I mean, we used to do these inverted L's and all these kind of things where you're just hunkering down on this on this joint to bring it over. And I think we've all realized that if that's what you're doing for your correction, it's not going to work. Um, what we're really doing is just taking out, you know, redundant tissue, setting the tension of the tissue back to where it's supposed to be. The normal resting tension and then you're out of there so i think that's number one and the number two is uh we also were always very resistant or slow to get people into therapy for bunions and i think that that led to stiffness of the joint as you'd expect so i, I usually get the people starting therapy on their own at one week and then i have them in you know formal therapy starting at three weeks so i don't really see a lot of stiffness uh, any longer as a complaint um, at the end. In particular for lapidus. Yeah, I agree. for lapidus. Yeah, I'd more so in head procedures for sure. So calcaneal bone graft, are you using some type of bone graft in most of these patients? Yeah, all of them. Uh, every one yeah. of them. Yep. And I, yeah, I started using it just because I, I just think it decreases the non-union rate and uh, and I, um, and it's, it's so simple to do. The, uh, the downside is so little. Yeah. And, um, and so if, if I can't take calc bone graft, which sometimes you can't, um, I typically will use one CC of something, but you don't need much. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think this is great. I think it, it helps you kind of fill in the little, you know, uh, divots and, you know, um, broken egg shell kind of that you've created in the joint. You pack that all in there. And so it's, it's mortar basically between two bricks when you think of it that way. But I also make a point of kind of packing a little bit into that one, two space. Um, so I think that helps me get that little spot weld I'm going after over there. But I agree, it's very minimal incision. We're just about to, we just got acceptance on FAI on a, on a paper on these calc autographs. I think over 900 of them or something. And it's, it's you know, really less than 1% at any kind of complications. So you can do yeah, it. Yeah, it, it is very. And, and the whole key is to avoid non-unions. And... Uh, and my, as I said, my non-union rate has gone down dramatically, but, you know, about once every other year, I do about 50 or 60 of these a year, I, I get one. So it's a 66-year-old, increased left bunion pain, followed for years non-op, increased lesser toe issues, really broader to that, uh, did a lapidus, 
um, with a um, 3DI plate uh, with a bunch of lesser toe. Um, and, uh, and this is a lady I did not use calc bone graft on. And she's, she's got pain at her first TMT joint with recurrence. And uh, she has a clear non-union. And there is nothing worse than having to tell somebody that the fusion didn't fuse. And, um, and so she had to have another operation. Um, other than the bone graft, which I now do on everybody, you can see how big my bunionectomy was. Again, this is back a number of years ago, but uh, is there anything else I could have done to avoid the, um, the non-union? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the fixation looks right. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know if with people, you never know if they're smoker, you know, bone metabolism, whatever, whatever, but from a technique standpoint, it looks pretty good. Um, there was no infection or anything, right? No. And, yeah. and I tell all my patients that non-union is a risk and yeah. So, but boy, it's not, it's not, not Alex Veras and non-unions. You don't want to have that one. Yeah. All right. Uh, you put one four pin in the, in the bunion, uh, right in the center, almost where you would, if you were going to do an Austin bunionectomy, I like to be perpendicular to the second metatarsal shaft, leave the big pins in because the big pins will help you with your rotation. Um, and so you can see here and hook over the second metatarsal. Um, you put the rotation clamp on the pin and you put the clamp together. Um, people have asked you, if you don't do a, a, um, a distal soft tissue release, do you have to make a second metatarsal incision? And you do. And so essentially we're gonna rotate and clamp. What, what order do you do uh, this step, step, Chris? Yeah, it's... Um... I kind of do it, uh, I do the rotation first and I'm kind of maintaining rotation as I clamp and do the reduction. So I think in some ways you're almost doing it at the same time, but I, I, I focus probably more first on rotation and then as I, as I have the rotation to where I want it, then I clamp it and bring the IM in. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, uh, we'll show in some cases here too, but you know, really kind of getting a sense too if 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 whatever sesamoid malalignment you see on X-ray, you know what is that coming from the bone malalignment, um, the rotation of the whole metatarsal, is it coming from that and lateral soft tissue or or soft tissue deviation or is it, is it a combo? Because I, I don't think it's always an all or all or none, um, and you can really get yourself into trouble um, if there's actually some soft tissue contracture as well as rotation and you're trying to do that all through rotation you'll end up have to make the sesamoid straight you'll end up having a toe that's that's supinated um on, on the table so um just be careful of that that's not necessarily just for this that's just in rotation in general just be mindful what you're rotating and what you're trying to correct but i do rotation first and then i do compression first. i agree and and if you you can see where my finger is here mm -hmm. i rotate it i supinate um and, and it, it will happen through the clamp. You can see the, uh, the small pin is, is rising up. That's how you know it's rotating. But the nice thing is, is that once it's where you want it, uh, then, you, then you clamp it down and everything's done. So what I do first is I rotate using the big pins. I clamp the IM angle. <clears throat> when you clamp the IM angle, you get that third, um, degree of set of correction which is which is plantar flexion which just brings you down and corrects your mary's line i clamp i lock the clamp and then i get an x-ray and it kind of tells you what you what you want so i'm going to talk a little about uh, show you a, case, a recurrent case chris and then we're going to talk a little bit about the one two uh, yeah. whether that could have saved me here i also think that some of my early recurrences I did not get enough um, enough rotation, and uh, and and this is one that that I'll show you. So clearly uh, everything's rotated. Um, you got the sunset sign. You have got uh, I am angle. Nothing special. And um, so at two weeks, 
Um, I, I don't love that picture, right? Everything's kind of still too round. I, I don't think that I um, that I got the um, I got my rotation where I where I needed it. And at six weeks, it starts recurring. Um, and at three months, I mean, she's not loving this. Now, I didn't do an Aiken. I might that you could have done that, um, but here's at six weeks and then three months, and you can see. I'm I'm just not convinced this is the the interconeiform or the one two. I think I just didn't get enough rotation. Um, comments? Yeah, I mean I think that could be. Um, I think you can sometimes, you know, when we were doing some early lab work, uh, looking at that oblique screw, uh, um, we saw we were when we, you know, instead of just doing the regular first metatarsal first caneiform screws, which was typical. When we added that oblique screw, which you have there to the second caneiform, that significantly reduced the amount of torsion that was still still left in the first ray. So you reduced the ability of that rotation to occur, which is great. That's what you're going for, including compression. Um, I think we've already started some cadaver work on the one to two to one to two screw as well, and that completely locks it once you do that. And I think that might be where I've seen some early failures um, is that maybe you didn't get enough rotation, maybe you lost a little rotation uh, because there's still a little frontal plane torque. But once you anchor the medial column to the second ray, then it's kind of locked for good. Um, there's a question on, I agree with you. I, I mean, I, I think that, that there's a question <laughs> on why do you put the pin perpendicular to the second and not the first? The reason I do is I feel like if the pin is perpendicular to the second, when I reduce the IM angle, um, the rotation is not a problem. When I reduce the IM angle, it brings it over and there's no distraction at the joint. It almost, almost compresses, starts the compression process mm -hmm. at the joint. If I do it perpendicular to the first, there is the potential just, just the way it's pulling on the pin um, that it will, it, it has a chance to bend the pin a little bit or distract it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, that's my answer to that. Um, comments on that, Chris? Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, uh, I, mean I think that's what you want to, one of the things you want to look for as you, if you use a tenaculum, if you use this, if you use our device here, once you reduce the IM angle in any lapidus really, um, as you have to assess that sagittal plane too. You can do that. You can do, the transverse plane, very easy on x-ray. You can see your IM angle got reduced. You can do the rotation fairly easily on, on these sesamoid views, and you just look at the toenail to see the toenail looks now flat to the ground. We know our varus and valgus is pretty locked in. The sagittal plane is always a little difficult because you're, you're doing a non-weight bearing, you know, fluoro shot. Really the best way is use your hand, and you've just got to feel the metatarsal heads and make sure those sesamoids don't feel like they're sticking out through the floor like a cavus foot. We all know what a cavus foot feels like in our hand versus a neutral foot. And so that's the point here is you're trying, you are trying to plantar flex the first met a little uh, so that we're getting a stable medial column, but also that it's compressing proximally. And you don't, you know, the worst thing in the world in a lapis would be to dorsiflex it by accident, uh, which we used to see, you know, as one of the more common malunions with when you just use screw fixation alone was that you get a dorsiflexion. Yeah. And that's, and that's why we put it in the center of the head. If you, if you have something you want to plantar flex it more, you can put it a little more dorsal. If you want to dorsiflex it, which occasionally happens with cavus feet, but I hate to do that, uh, you put it a little lower in the head. So uh, this compression screw, uh, Chris, to be totally honest, I, I learned this from you and Greg Burlett, um, and I, I've been doing it for a number of years. Tell me, how the use of this screw evolved in y'all's practice. Yep, yeah, uh, so kind of similar to the evolution of the one, two screw, you know, back when we came up with this, uh, this shot was we were doing standard lapidus fixation with two parallel screws in the, in the same plane on the first TMT joint, you know, one distal to proximal, one proximal to distal. And, but we were using the tenaculum to help us reduce the IM angle and then in the OR, you'd pop the tenaculum and you see some of them spring. And so then we start shooting this as the third screw. So we do the first two screws, and then if, it, if the IM angle sprung, 
and we'd fire this screw in and that seemed to solve the problem. Um, and then as lock plating came around, anatomic specific lock plating uh, for Lapidus, um, and what benefits that brought was a much more stable construct, earlier weight bearing instead of six weeks, you know, you're doing a week or two weeks, whatever your comfort is uh, now with lock plating on there. Um, it really made sense to still have this screw because versus the other one to two screw or uh, one to first metatarsal uh, cuneiform screw. Uh, because what I like about this screw too is that you can, you're getting compression across the first TMT and you also get a little IM um, you know, stabilization. It's, it's drawing the first metatarsal over to the second a little bit. Um, so it's a little bit of a weird shot if you haven't done it before. Um, it feels, it kind of feels like the mirror image of a Liz Frank screw, honestly, it's kind of the opposite. Um, but if the first, you know, first couple of times it might feel like an awkward shot and it's a little hard to target, that's where this little device, this little rail gun kind of device has really been helpful uh, to shoot yeah. this. Far. I've been, I've been using this device uh, just, you know, proof of concept and I kind of got to the point where I like it because yeah. once, once you've got it lined up, you just fire it in and then I'm done. But um, um, you notice on the left uh, side that I've cut the pin in the metatarsal head short. And you need to do this uh, both if you fire the screw as well as if you use the device. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, other, I think the other point I wanted to point out here is that the angle, the trajectory of this screw um, that sometimes people don't realize, it, it's, it's slightly low to high, right? So you're, you know, you're not quite, if you're looking at the medial first metatarsal, you're not quite at the 50 yard line. You're usually just a little under that horizon and you're shooting a little bit high towards the second cuneiform because the second cuneiform is the, the peak of the transverse arch of the foot. So you're, you're shooting that. And that again, gives you a little bit more plantar flexion type of compression when that screw goes in. And it also gets you know, that hardware out of the way for any dorsal plate. Uh, so I, I just want to point out that picture on the left. You've got that angle like perfect. See it, see it right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I, little, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. A yeah. little low to high. You just got more bone in that middle, in that uh, medial cuneiform, middle yeah. cuneiform. Yeah. If you go low to high. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. So the plate sits dorsal medial. I, I, I really, I really think the plate sits where it sits. Uh, there are four different plates. Um, there's one with this, this two millimeter step off. And it's very interesting when you derotate very often, there is a, a, a little lip and this two millimeter steps off just, just fits right over the lip or the zero. A lot of, some of my partners just like to take that lip off and like a zero. Uh, sometimes there's no lip and uh, so it's a zero. Um, and so this is the evolution um, and Chris, this is the evolution of both you and I because we were, <laughs> We were involved in all of this stuff, but here, here's the Darko uh, plate, and the Darko plate uh, was a did not have a compression slot, mm -hmm. uh, but but we did I, I did use the uh, I call it the Columbus uh, screw, and then the Ortholock plate which had a compression slot, mm -hmm. and then uh, this is a Lapa fuse, which um, is a thinner plate that mm -hmm. that that really is designed to go down the metatarsal shaft just a little bit um but i really think that this is the best plate i i've uh i'm now kind of totally even if i'm doing a first tmt fusion after a total ankle i'm using this plate um yeah. for the those reasons yeah I, I agree the i think it it uh it's a lot more um yeah i guess thinner but uh just more contoured, like contoured. Energy, yeah, I guess I don't know what the right term would be, um, because that with any hard any plate hardware of the first TMT, you know, bulk of the hardware can be an issue sometimes. If you've got a, a thinner um, female, th thinner anybody really, um, if you've got a bulky plate on the top there, even when I mean I always tell them, hey, you know, ten percent of the time we may have to come take this plate out because you might feel it you know, they're still pissed off when they're in that 10%. So, you know, I, I try, it's always nice if you can use the, a, a much more contoured kind of lower profile plate. Uh, and that's what I've really found with the, with the Lapa fuse is it just fits that kind of notch in the anatomy a little bit better. So 
Compression, we talked about compression to decrease non-union. Uh, there is some discussion that, that in fact, micro motion is a benefit. That kind of goes against what we've always uh, believed. So um, I, I think you can get a, uh, a fusion without compression, but, um, but for me, the fusions are much quicker and the patients are less painful. Um, so we, we talked about the one, two screw and your evolution. Do you, do you put it through the plate or do you not put it through the plate? You know, I've, it's a good, it's a good question. I've, I've done it both ways. Um, I honestly kind of make that call depending on where my first, so my first screws at a bleak screw to the second caneiform. So it kind of depends on what real estate I have to work with. I get that screw in first uh, and then I, then I, take both of these plates and kind of see which one fits the best. And, you know, ideally, um, you know, if the, if the pocket screw there that's in the plate, if that's right where I want the one, two screw, perfect. Then I'll just use that right through the plate. Um, some, you know, it really kind of depends on the trajectory though. Cause again, the second Met's going to be a little North of the first Met. So the screws got to be able to shoot up a little bit. So it hits the second Met. You don't want to go under the second Met with it. Um, right. Otherwise, um, I, I'll put this, the other plate there and just work it around the head of the of the other screw. But yeah. sometimes yeah. it gets a little busy. Yeah. All right, Chris, tell tell us about these. Um, yeah. These cases. I'll I'll yeah. advance them for you. So yeah, this just kind of reiterate some of the points I wanted to make. So if you haven't, <clears throat> I think we've all understood rotation when it comes to lapidus for a long, long time. It's been described for, but for a long time, but I, I think really flew under the radar, really didn't get its just service. Um, yeah, so uh, until the last five years or so. So I think we're all much more aware of it now. And in that regard, I would say something that we've indoctrinated into our practice is, is getting a sesamoid axial view um, as part of the routine workup on, on your bunion cases. We didn't used to always do that. We used to just get a three view. Uh, weight bearing actually. So make sure you get a sesamoid view like this if it's a bunion workup case because it'll really show you a lot. Uh, and in like this case, you know, I would I would make an argument to you that this case has rotation both of the soft tissue and of the bone. So if you look at the metatarsal, yeah, it's rotated, but look where the sesamoids are versus the crista. You know, I have the arrow kind of pointing where the crista is. So in my mind, I couldn't just do this with rotating the metatarsal only. Uh, the sesamoids still wouldn't be where they needed to be. Um, there's the kind of sunset view in the middle picture I'm talking about. If you can see the articular surface on the top of the sesamoid in your AP view, you know that it's really over there. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, in my mind, sagittal plane instability of the first TMT joint, what does it do? It overloads the lateral, uh, the, ne the next raise over. So very common is to see these chronic second MPP you know, plantar plate disrupt, you know, dislocations, crossover toe like this, you start getting major overload of the second, third TMT or MTPs, that's, that's first ray instability. So, you know, a lot of the stuff we just talked about, um, kind of aiming, aiming for the one, uh, for the lapidus fusion, aiming for this kind of one, two screw um, that you can see fully threaded. So I'm just holding the rotate, holding the alignment that I got intraoperatively with that one, two screw. <clears throat> get a shortening while when I take I have to take a decent amount of length back I'll do what I call double cut while so we take a little wafer out so I don't plantar flex the while too much plantar plate repair um, uh, our surgery our hospital was at misplaced the twist off screws that day so these are threaded K wires I use for an Aiken and for a while I, it does work but it wasn't wasn't that was that was digging into the toolbox a little bit um, but I wanted to I wanted to show that third picture <clears throat> excuse me, where I say I try to get a little spot weld. That's the spot weld I look for. If I can get that little one, two metatarsal base spot weld, uh, I think it's almost impossible to get a recurrence unless it's just soft tissue only. Um, they just, that's been one of my biggest predictors I can see when I look at x-rays for lapidus and we've gone back and looked over our cases. If I can get that one, two uh, shot, it's good. So again, look at kind of how proximal that one, two, um, that one two screw is again. So this is that's this is another case. You can flip to that one. That's fun. Yeah. Uh, similar. This guy's a, this guy was was tough as far as just a patient. Air is a um, aeronautical engineer pilot. Uh, wants to understand everything about everything. Wants to look at the X-ray. Wants me to physically measure the angles every visit with them. 
because he's just into it, right? So this has to be perfect. And um, so I, again, when do I th throw the one, two screw? If I don't want to take a chance of any recurrence, I'm going with it. So uh, kind of same thing, um, the, the, la the oblique screw first, get the compression. Um, I, have, I would say I have found myself doing a lot more Aikens uh, over the years and not, almost nothing to do with the x-ray. It's really on the table. My, once I got my lapidus done and I see my metatarsals are parallel, uh, if I still have anything from the clinical view, I sit to the side of the table and I look at the foot from the patient's view. If I see anything from the clinical view, looks like the toe is still dialing over anything, I give it an ache. And I, I've one of the things I tell the fellow, I never, I never regret doing an ache, and I've regretted not doing an ache. So yeah, yeah, gotta, you're pretty, if you think pretty, about it, if yeah, you think about low, it, do it. Yeah, pretty low threshold there. So yeah, you sent um, me this one. I love this one. This was a tough one. Um, so she comes in with uh, previous bunion like. 20 years prior, uh, you know, distal osteotomy, you can see, you can see quite a big, ro big rotation again on that sesamoid view, even on the AP view, because you can see that sun setting of the, of the sesamoid again. But she had a ton of metatarsalgia, sub second and third. Uh, and in her case was really a combination of overload from the instability in, the, in, a, in a long first ray, but a hypermobile first ray. And then she had brachymeta in the fourth. So she was really, really pounding on two and three um, with this foot. So this was not a, a, a quick five minute uh, bunion consult like we sometimes get. Um, it was really kind of explaining, you know, what, m why did the first bunion maybe not work? Why is this, why is this a complicated case? And then how is the bunion really driving everything else going in her forefoot? Um, so I think, you know, this was one of the times where I thought, you know, an actual wedge cut is, was an okay thing. Uh, so again, I, I, I agree with Hodges. I really try not to take flat cuts or wedge cuts out of the first TMT because I want to maintain length. But in this case, she had a long first met um, and I had overload of two and three. Um, so in this case, I actually had some length to spare on the first. So I did a, um, a wedge cut through the first TMT. Uh, there is a I don't know if that's available yet, but there is a, a guide available by request if, from the Lapafuse uh, set if you wanted to try that. But it's just, it's a chamfered, it's a, um, it's a captured cut guide basically. So I use that to help correct the IM angle because uh, I had length to spare here. That's the Lapafuse plate. So what you said, what Hodge just said, kind of it wraps around and down the metatarsal and then gives me the clearance for that one to two screw. Um, but then I was still kind of struggling because I had that short four with the overload of two and three. So you can see, I really didn't want to shorten two and three too much, but I had a balance at the four. Um, so when I had to bring them back that much, I'd take the double cut uh, on the while so I can bring the head back up again. And then, uh, and then the Aiken. So yeah, this one, I was, this was a tough one, but I, it really turned out great. Um, Thankfully, she just has a brachy on the one foot. I was worried I'd have to do it again on the other side. I wouldn't, wasn't <laughs> sure if I could hit it, hit it out of the park again. But um, so again, right. just kind of stepwise progression again. That's a that's an awesome case. All right. So when we put the plate on, we lock proximally, we compress through the plate, and then lock distally. Um, I don't always leave the compression screw in. Sometimes, if if you don't have a lot of room to compress, it's a little proud. So I don't mind taking it out. If I'm going to do the one, two screw, sometimes it's in the way. Um, and this is what it looks like, the construct. Um, so we talked about the bunionectomy. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we talked about the Aiken. If you think about it, probably do it. Post-op protocol. So mine is I put them in a corrective dressing for 10 to 14 days. Uh, they put weight on their heel. Um, and then I put them in a short boot and get them moving. Um, I take this, the sutures out or I use dissolvable sutures and um, at, at six weeks, they're out of the boot. Is that kind of where you are, Chris? Yeah, I mean, the big picture, I'm about the same. Um, like I get them back a little early. I see them like a week after surgery and we put them in the boot then. Uh, I have them heel weight bear in the boot for two weeks, but I have them doing range of motion exercises. Then at week three, they go full weight bearing in the boot. We start them in therapy that visit. And then hopefully I got them out of the boot into a shoe at six weeks. So pretty, they're the ballpark of the same. Yeah. yeah, but we're, I mean, we're, I always t tell the fellows, you got to treat bunion patients like bunion patients. They want to put weight on it. And, uh, and I've, I've done that 
since I've started with the with the plate screw construct. Um, so we talked about all these things: no shortening, reproducible three plane correction, one surgeon with little fiddle factor. Um, so uh, when do you do your lesser toe uh, surgery? Do you do the while first or after you've done your lapidus? I do it after the lapidus. I do the first rate, all the first rate work first, um, because that's going to set my length. Uh, then I know where to base my while off of. I also don't want to be putting a clamp on the second mat or anything if if I've got a while already done. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Um, so here's another lap of fuse case. Um, so recurrence, we talked a little bit of that, how to prevent and what to do if it happens. So. Uh, here's a 59-year-old painful bunion, mild asymptomatic, symptomatic, symmetrical flat foot with a crossover hammer toe. She's got gapping. Um, I did this, and she just started at 14 weeks. She said, my bunion's coming back. And I got a great fusion, but I did not – I got the gapping at the, mm -hmm. at the intermetatarsal. And I've had a, a number of these where I've been able to – go distal. And so this is one that I was, I used the MIS and, um, and went distal and she's, she's happy. Um, Lapidus as a revision operation. You've already showed one. This is a 45 year old with flexible. She had a big shift scarfy Chevron um, at six weeks. She's looking okay. Uh, at 14 weeks, my bunion is back. And this is one that I was able to uh, to do a lapidus procedure and uh, and get a good fusion, and she uh, she did great. So lapidus as a revision is certainly great, and we've already shown case of that. And finally, lapidus with flat foot. You can see the gapping medial column instability and flat foot is bad. And this is one I did an arthresis screw. Uh, her posterior tib was fine. And then I did the lapidus and her right was great. And she came back four years later, wanted the other side done. I want the same thing done. She did. And the insurance said no arthresis screw. So I did an MIS uh, MDCO with, uh, with pro step. Nice. So final, final notes on lapidus, Chris, uh, you know, take it home. We've been talking about lapidus pretty consistently uh, for four weeks um, in your in your armamentarium is is lapidus something that um, that that you feel great consistent results uh, with this system and moving forward yeah absolutely it's it's i think when when that was one of the things i remember at the early design phase of this we went around the room with all the other design surgeons and i think the question posed to us was you know hey what percentage of your bunion cases do you do lapidus or distal osteotomy, whatever? And, you know, I think I was one of the few in the room saying, I'm like 90% lapidus. Uh, we're like, what about, you know, the moderate deformity? I'm like, yeah, lapidus. I mean, it's just because I know it'll work. It's reliable. It holds. Um, and I always felt with my distal osteotomies, I was always pushing them to try to get bigger correction. And sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. So for me, lapidus is very reliable. Um, very reproducible. Um, with the system like this, you can do it. Time in the OR is really not a problem any longer. It's really just as quick as if you're trying to do an osteotomy and shift things over and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think when you really want to make sure it's, it's, it's a, uh, you need it to be stable and you, and you want to make sure you don't have recur recurrence and definitely if it's a bigger deformity, uh, my go-to is a lapidus for sure. So, Chris, this is your proximal osteotomy in your practice. Yeah. You don't do opening wedges. You don't do um, any of the goofy proximal osteotomies we did for your proximal chevrons. This is no. your proximal. Occasionally, you know, occasionally we've got a fellow who wants to know how to learn learn how to do a Mao or Ludwoff. We might, you know, but uh, or if I did something like that on the opposite foot and the patient wants me to match it. But, no, it's it's pretty much the proximal osteotomy. It's a good analogy. And that is, and that is for me also. Oh. So um, I had a, uh, I had a, a art history teacher who said that, that uh, great art is, is a reflection of man's inhumanity to man. And, um, and sometimes Bunyan feels like it's, it's man's inhumanity to me. 
Um, but bunion surgery is, is an art. And as we try to develop systems to make this more consistent, attention to detail um, is absolutely necessary to bring about favorable results. Don't underpower your correction when a bigger operation is called for. And uh, I know Chris and I have talked about this offline. I, I am very excited. We've been using Lapafuse in Charlotte now for, uh, for months, and I am very excited about um, the results that we're getting. So with that, Chris, I'll, I'll thank you. I, I always yeah, love, I love uh, our conversations, and you and I have evolved so much together in Lapidus over the years. And, um, and I think uh, we've kind of reached this point. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Both oh, Chris and I are in Montana right now. So, um, so it's early. Have it. Yeah. 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 We can get an evening.